I have titled this talk, Rethinking Education as a Learning Ecosystem. That phrase learning ecosystem is something that has caught attention in international circles, but what does it really mean to build a learning ecosystem? What does it mean to think about all of the learning assets that we might connect in ways that support today's learners and their futures? As um, was introduced, I'm Greg. I'm joining you from Pittsburgh in the United States. I'm privileged to serve as the executive director of the Grable Foundation, which is a private charitable foundation focused on improving the lives of children in this corner of the world. Um, kids who, especially because of economic reasons, don't have the same opportunities as their peers. I'm also founder and co-chair of a learning ecosystem called Remake Learning, and we're going to dig a lot into that today. And then I'm the co-author of a book that was published this year entitled When You Wonder Your Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. And it's this book that really is an expression of what I want to share today, the work that has been 20 years in the making to rethink education and what learning needs to be. Work that's about uplifting creativity for our young people in some brilliant ways in and out of school. Work that's about inspiring curiosity in all of the places where young people might learn. And work that's about raising caring and kind kids who one day will be leading this world and solving the wicked problems in front of us and supporting prosperity and well-being for generations to come. So today I really wanna share one big idea, one big idea during this hour together. And it's the simple idea that learning happens everywhere. Now that seems so obvious to say that, but we have not structured our education systems to genuinely embrace this idea that learning happens everywhere and that we need to think about all of those places where young people and older learners learn and how to capture all of those experiences in brilliant ways that honor their learning, that credential their learning, that support their future prosperity and skill building in ways that allow them to navigate the economy and our communities in some brilliant ways. I have colleagues around this world who have captured this work and, um, and I want to acknowledge here the important work that our schools do. Our vocational schools, our technical schools, our public schools, our private schools. Schools have been holding our communities and our world together in brilliant ways. And in no way do I want to demean their work, rather I want to celebrate it. Our teachers are incredible and what our teachers do and our educators do for lifelong learners, for our young learners, for learners everywhere is brilliant. And it's also true that we are learning so much from the learning sciences themselves about the ways that young people are developing their identities, the ways that young people are seeking and pursuing information, the ways that young people are producing things in their lives. The learning sciences tells us that we need to think about their prosperity in fundamentally different ways. And so how do we utilize the learning ecosystems that are all around us to augment the brilliant work that all types of schools already do. And really that's about connecting learners in all of the places where they are. Yes, schools are important, but our young people spend only 14 to 20% of their waking hours inside the walls of learning spaces of schools and vocational centers and campuses of higher education. How do we capture all of those other places they might be? at home, online like this, in a library, in a museum, even in our parks, in out of school time programs, in all of the places that they might be learning and playing together. This is a conversation that's happening worldwide. And it's happening in places like St. Petersburg, Russia, in Barcelona, Spain, in Doncaster, England, in Christchurch, New Zealand, in cities, in places, in countries all around this world, educators and municipal officials and others are asking, what if our city, what if our region, what if our place had a learning ecosystem? This conversation is happening among our educators and education policy officials, among our government officials, among business leaders, among anyone who cares about learning and training supporting the next generation. And back in 2014, Michelle Cahill, who was then with the Carnegie Corporation of New York, wrote this about learning ecosystems. An ecosystem draws in energy and contributions from a broad base of leadership, 
including educators, advocates, policymakers, philanthropy, government, and civic voices. At the heart of a learning ecosystem is the ability to draw upon the assets of an entire city or community to support students as they grapple with two primary tasks, building competencies and forming their identities. So all around the world, you and your colleagues are asking these questions about learning ecosystems. And we're really lucky because there are good researchers and thinkers worldwide who've begun to think about this learning ecosystem model and what an ecosystemic approach might look like. Our colleagues at Innovation Unit in London, working with the Cutter Foundation and WISE, have produced reports, publications, webinars, podcasts and the like, elucidating what it is that communities are doing as we think about learning ecosystems. It's also true of colleagues at organizations like Big Change, again, working with innovation units and also an organization called Radical and Rewired and others to help us reimagine education and what it needs to be. Because so many of us, so many of you are asking a very fundamental question. How might we rethink where, how, and why learning happens? What if we really thought about just busting down these walls of schools, not literally busting them down, but thinking about our regions as learning campuses? What would that look like? How would we approach things differently? How would we budget differently? How would we plan differently? What would we do differently to support our learners and their futures? So if that's true, how do you build a network? How do you build that cluster? How do you activate the learning ecosystem all around us? While we can't be together in a room today and we're not physically together to talk about this work, to ask questions, to wrestle together, I'm hopeful that in this time together with you, I can offer some lessons learned about activating an ecosystem that's helpful to you in your city, in your country, maybe even in your school or just your neighborhood. How is it that we activate learning ecosystems in all of the places we might be? And I want to offer a case study, a case study that will give you color. And you won't be surprised that case study comes from this little corner of the world of southwestern Pennsylvania in the United States. And in so doing, I want you to see your place in this work. As I talk about Pittsburgh, think about St. Petersburg. Think about Copenhagen. Think about Milan. Think about the place where you might be. And I'm gonna try and offer some lessons learned too that ideally will help you just a little bit, some very practical and tactical things you might do that will help you as you first open the opportunities of learning for your young people, for your teenagers, for those in higher education and beyond. So let's begin by turning to our case study. And let me take you to a place called Pittsburgh, not because it's a perfect place by any means. I certainly think it's a special place, but it's a place that's been working to activate a learning ecosystem and to ignite the creativity, the curiosity, and the caring of its learners, all of them. Because for 15 years in Southwestern Pennsylvania, we have some experience trying this. We didn't set out to create a learning ecosystem, but as we sit here today and look back over the last 15 years, that's precisely what we have done. We've created a cluster, we've created a network, we've created an ecosystem with all sorts of successes, all sorts of bumps and bruises, all sorts of lessons learned that I will share today. And we've learned something about what it means to connect, to connect educators across schools and across school systems to one another in ways that they weren't before, but also to connect teachers to designers and artists and technologists in some profound new ways, to connect technologists to career and technical education leaders, to connect higher education to out of school time programs, after school, mentoring, summer learning, and so many other individuals and people in some profoundly new ways. So welcome to a place called Pittsburgh. This is where it starts, where learning starts. Creativity, complexity, talent. This is where innovation starts. It starts right here in our libraries, our museums, our communities, in our schools. This is where the future starts. Whenever we learn something about ourselves, about our community, about our world, the future begins again. 
And every day, educators around the world are taking risks, reaching higher, pushing the limits of learning. Here in the Pittsburgh region, we call this many things. Learner-centered, deeper, personalized, technology-enhanced, culturally responsive, STEM, STEAM, maker, next generation, 21st century, engaging, relevant, equitable. The future of learning is here. It's in our hills and in our hollows, in our towns and neighborhoods, along our rivers and in the steel city. This is Pittsburgh. Here, we know where the future starts. See more at remakelearning.org. And the future of learning is in your city. It's in your state, it's in your country. And what we each need to do is unleash these assets that are all around us in ways that support our learners. So let's dive into this learning ecosystem that we call Remake Learning as an example for what you might do in the place for which you're responsible. And when we talk about Remake Learning, we talk about an Remake Learning as a network, a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning practices for our young people whom we know are navigating these times of rapid technological and social change. So in our corner of the world, Remake Learning is a professional network of educators. And I use that, that word educators in a broad sense to capture educators who are in our schools and school buildings, but also in our out of school time organizations, in our early learning centers, in higher education, all of whom are working together to reimagine learning. It's a network that involves thousands of people from more than 600 organizations in this tiny little place called Pittsburgh. What types of organizations do they represent? Schools, yes, schools, absolutely. But also museums and libraries and early learning centers and after school programs, creative industries and companies and businesses, and certainly our college campuses. They're all working together to create more engaging, more relevant, more equitable learning opportunities for our young people. And those seem like simple, such simple words. So what do we mean when we refer to these words? Well, when learning is engaging, we know that learners have the time, the resources, the support, the encouragement to become active problem solvers, creatives, creators, and innovators. And I'll give you some real examples. When learning is relevant for our young people and learners of all ages, it resonates with their own interests, with their context and their abilities and experiences while also allowing for room for all sorts of growth and exposure. It prepares learners for our futures in which interdisciplinary skills like critical thinking and collaboration are increasingly salient. And when learning is equitable, more supports and more opportunities are afforded to those of greatest need. One of the things that we've done in our region is pull together hundreds, hundreds of educators in and out of school, early learning through higher education and beyond to think about what is it that we want our learners to become and how would we describe that and what is the profile the words that we can put to paper in that in a way that'll drive all of the work of all of these discrete organizations that I described as being part of this network and what you see here is that simple expression of a profile wordsmith by hundreds of educators and policymakers and business leaders and others to identify those knowledge, those skills, those dispositions that we want for our, our learners to be able to do, to pursue academically, socially, culturally, creatively, collectively, lovingly. This is the profile of learners that we want to create. And among the tools that we've used to express this profile are tactics like portraits of a graduate, learner profiles, and student portfolios. So what are these things if they're not familiar to you? We of course have all sorts of tests and test scores to help understand who our young people are. We have all sorts of credentials, but a portrait of a graduate, for example, is a way that a school or a college campus or another type of learning organization really creates that sensibility of that profile that I just described. And a learner profile pulls it together in a portfolio, really drawing upon portfolio education but understanding how we personalize learning in some really special ways 
and then personalize it in a way that creates pathways for each individual learner. And then using portfolios so that young people and others have all sorts of artifacts, not just test scores, not just diplomas, but all sorts of artifacts that express who they are, the knowledge that they hold, the skills that they've developed in a way that'll help them navigate all sorts of opportunities. And as we think about these profiles, as we think about these portfolios, we have to find ways to connect them in all of the places where young people learn. And as we do so, we have to think about those hours outside of learning spaces in schools and how it is that we connect those hours, honor and respect what happens, badge and credential learning in some new ways. And for us, and ideally for you too, we need to think about our most marginalized learners. Learners who are living in difficult economic conditions, learners who are marginalized in some um, ways particular to their communities, learners in our rural areas that find themselves far, far away from the metro areas that have the assets of museums and libraries and maybe only have a school building or a special community center. We need to think about our girls and our girls particularly in the sciences and math. And we need to think about our learners with disabilities. And so how do we afford more opportunities and more experiences to those mar most marginalized in the communities in which we live? This is what a network looks like. It's complicated, it's messy, it's not a hierarchy. It's a lot easier to say this happens and this happens and you report here and you report here. In a network, a community comes together and all sorts of people and projects and organizations work together to create new opportunities for our young people. So that's what started to happen here in 2007. And it started simply enough by creating time and space so that individuals representing higher education, our NGO and civil society organizations, our schools, of course, those in the private sector or in the public sector who are funders of education and education related work, certainly our business leaders, especially in the creative industries, looking to our museums and libraries, other, other cultural assets, and of course, our government officials, bringing to them together, creating time and space for new conversations in an interdisciplinary way. This is work that exploded over a few years. And to this group of individuals and organizations that came together, we began to think about these modern frameworks, these modern approaches, these modern pedagogies that express the type of learning that we want for our learners taking advantage of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, adding the A for arts and STEAM education and thinking about interdisciplinary learning, but also thinking about youth media and linked learning and connected learning and maker learning and all sorts of words and phrases that describe the type of learning experiences and learning pathways that we wanna create for our young people. So what did that look like 10 years ago? Let me give you a number of examples to give you color. Here's a school a school district that literally began to bust down the walls among what had been the industrial arts, the arts and computer sciences and computational thinking, and began thinking about the interdisciplinary work that happens in these skill building spaces and the instruction that happens in these spaces and how that singular experience of rethinking that education in that wing in that particular school led to all sorts of design changes in the physical spaces of the libraries and classrooms of the school building, but also its approach to professional development and learning and the way that it budgeted and started to procure services, materials, devices to support a new approach to learning. And in this school district that I will describe as um, not a place you'd have imagined the future to take hold, not a well-resourced school, they began to see real changes. Things like dropout rates going to practically zero, practically zero because young people had a sense of agency. They wanted to be in the school. They wanted to learn. They felt connected in new and special ways. You saw climbing test scores and other things. And these are just traditional measures. We know that all sorts of other learning is happening in these spaces. And this school didn't accomplish this alone. They worked with universities like Carnegie Mellon University. They worked with companies like Small Lab and Modern Teacher. They've worked with museums like the Andy Warhol Museum and others they turned to their community to reimagine learning in that school space. In another school, in a singular kindergarten classroom, looking at our youngest learners, 
a kindergarten teacher finding a way to work with an artist who's also a specialist in robotics to think about how they could take advantage of toys and devices and things that were familiar to kids, things that they love, and to break them apart and create new opportunities for wonder and learning and expression in some new ways, connecting wooden blocks to circuitry in a kindergarten space with five and six-year-olds in some new and profound ways that just lit up that classroom. We saw it happening in all sorts of out of school time spaces. In the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, thinking about maker-centered learning and invention and creation and taking advantage of the do-it-yourself, the DIY movement, to think about the ways in which they could have learners and the adults in their lives learning together, using power tools and using sewing machines and using all sorts of devices to create things that the learners themselves wanted to create. And in this sense, the learners were our young people and their parents and grandparents having this dynamic multi-generational learning experience together. It's happened in places like our libraries, reimagining teen library services. You know, libraries at least here were thought of as a place that were dinosaurs, not a place that teenagers wanted to go. And you know what the library did? The library kept its books and the library kept its librarians to be sure, but they brought in hip hop artists and they brought in film documentarians and they brought in tools and devices and guitars and other things into a library and said, libraries aren't meant to be quiet spaces. Libraries are meant to be learning spaces. And if a library is meant to be a learning space, what are the things that we need to do to create that vibrant learning? And you know what? These libraries have seen a twofold increase in teenagers coming back to the library. And they've seen a 20% increase in book circulation. And you know why? Because the kids wanted to be there and they had a sense of agency and they were lit up by their interests and supported by the caring adults around them. And when they did so, then they realized, I have all of these assets, including books that I can use in some new and profound ways to support my learning. It happened in retail-like spaces. Imagine your commercial districts having these pop-up and permanent spaces for out-of-school time learning, connecting the arts and the sciences and invention in creative new ways and infusing the places where people are when they're not in schools and they're not in learning spaces and creating other opportunities to create attractive learning. It certainly happened in our campuses of higher education. And if I look right here in my backyard at a university like Carnegie Mellon and their work, for example, at the Create Lab, which is a community robotics lab, forging partnerships with more than 120 schools and out of school time organizations to bring the absolute creativity, artificial intelligence, Harry Potter, Potter wizardry to me into places of learning all around our urban and rural areas, connecting higher education and our schools and other learning sites in some profoundly new ways. That happened too with centers and units like the Entertainment Technology Center, connecting entertainment and education in some profound ways to support learning and professional development. And also focused on our teachers and truly creating spaces like one called Transform Ed, where teachers can go, they're earning credit for professional development and learning, but they have an opportunity to play with hardware and software and to mix it around, maybe even break it, but to find a comfortable space in which they can use new tools and new devices to think about how they use those things to support their instructional practice and their own pedagogical approach and having the time and space as adult learners to experiment to support the learners in their classroom. This is really a simple slide and yet so profoundly important. As we rethink education, we need to rethink education as learning. For so many of us, education has boundaries and it suggests schools. And there's a formality of exams and diplomas and other credentials. Whereas learning happens everywhere. Learning is happening all the time and everywhere. And how do we connect it in ways that adults know to support learners to say, hey, you know, you're interested in computational thinking. You're doing some amazing work in this classroom. Let me connect you to the science center. Let me connect you to the libraries. There are other opportunities for you to continue this interest. Creating an environment in which learning happens everywhere and the adults, the educators and otherwise 
are knowledgeable enough to make those connections and to support learners in some profound ways. So that was just 2010. As this work continued into 2012 and beyond, we really began to see this ecosystem take hold. And it was about 10 years ago that this idea of a network, of a cluster, of an ecosystem really began to take hold in some profound ways, such that by 2017, we could celebrate a decade of really beginning to rethink education as learning, as a mindset across this region, and thinking about our place on planet Earth as a campus for learning for all of our students, young and old alike, and the educators that support them. In 2017, we could talk about more than 100 schools involved in this network, nearly 30 libraries, nearly 20 museums, all sorts of community centers, all sorts of funding entities, of businesses, more than 30 campuses of higher education, more than 100 civil society organizations, a remarkable collection of people coming together in some profound new ways to support education and learning. We could celebrate more than $100 million of new investments to support this new type of learning and absolutely transformed learning spaces, understanding that environment drives behavior and creating all sorts of physical new learning spaces who are then supported by newly trained and credential educators in these spaces, partnering together to really engage our learners and also their parents, families and caregivers and the others in their lives that are so crit critical to our learners as they create their own trajectories. In fact, we published a playbook back in um, just before this decade celebration to capture for ourselves the things that we had learned, but also to share with um, other places in initially around the United States, but subsequently around the world. And places ranging from Fremont, California and Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina to Christchurch, New Zealand and Barcelona, Spain have used this playbook, which you can find online if you search for Remake Learning Playbook. And I will simply describe some lessons learned as we reach that 10 year mark. First is to really build upon your strengths. Every place, every city, every region has its own identity, its own institutions, its own history that impact learners in some constructive and innovative ways. So for us here in Pittsburgh, we have a long legacy of making things. This was an industrial center. It was a steel city. It is a steel city that has now become a hub for robotics, for advanced manufacturing and for the arts. And so that combination gave Remake Learning the opportunity to really advance maker-centered learning and STEM and STEAM learning in ways that connected to the real world experience of our learners, of our schools and other sites of learning. You have your own strengths in the place where you are absolutely build upon them and think about the assets that you have available. We have to think about cross-sector collaboration in a new way. You know, that word collaboration has become so hollow and we talk about partnerships, but what does it really mean to genuinely partner in some profound new ways, especially among people who had, would never have connected without that, that they would have stayed in the silos of their vocational center or their campus of higher education and just gone about their work to be sure in brilliant ways, but not taking advantage of what might have been. How do we connect that? And how do we really connect school leaders and artists and inventors and political leaders and the like? It's common now, for example, to see kids flying drones across classrooms in Pittsburgh or educators teaching alongside gamers and designers and officials, public officials, declaring the importance of remaking learning. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens by organizing and connecting people and connecting them in relationships in a way that prompts them to work together. And we've got to equip our educators to innovate. We've got to really trust our educators and the remarkable craft to which they attend. There is no other profession other than the education field that is continuously working to improve its craft. And how do we support our educators with new technology, with innovative professional development, with grants to attend conferences, maybe even funding to experiment and try new ideas in the spaces for which they're responsible? Those, that library to which I referred to earlier, that began as a small experiment. It began as a little bet. And today it is an entire system of dozens of libraries where you find teenagers engaged with filmmaking and invention alongside books and learning in ways that we've always known libraries to be. Starting small, making that little bet, and equipping our educators in and out of school to try things, to be sure in developmentally appropriate ways, but 
honoring and trusting them. We need to be open and inclusive. And by that, I mean this, we have to actively invite people in. Early on in the work of Remake Learning, it was important that educators started to invite in the designers and the gamers and the technologists and others who weren't traditionally involved in education but to invite them in because that we saw their caring and their passion and their interest in supporting learning and applying the learning sciences in profound ways. We have to actually make that invitation and not just assume that people will come. We have to encourage them in and we have to be big and audacious in this work. The days of listen, memorize, test and repeat are not serving our kids well. They probably never really did, but it's especially true now given all that we know from the science of learning and what we're learning about learning itself. And Remake Learning is proof that caring people working together can improve the lives and trajectories of today's learners. And then when we talk about learners, we have to keep learners at the center of all of our work. But it's not just about our young learners, it's the older ones too. It's those teachers and the educators themselves and everyone who's working in the education space, we need to listen to them. We need to trust them. We need to love them. They deserve learning spaces that work together to nurture creativity, curiosity, and compassion. And we have to meet people where they are. People come to this work in different ways, in different places. And we can't just now say, and now we shall all do this. Those grand um, pronouncements, they just never work. We have to meet people where they are, the passions and interests that they bring to the work and not what it is that we want them to be. We need to invite them into this work. So as we reach 10 years, we could celebrate learning being remade here in this corner of the world called Pittsburgh. When it's hands-on learning, it's something that you want to do. How do we make Pittsburgh the very best place in the world for children? We're all about empowerment, but empowerment through technology innovation. We work with local service organizations and local students, parents, families, and adults in such a way that our technologies can be authentically useful in them improving their circumstances. When I go back to school, I'll be able to apply what I've learned here into my classwork. And when I do that, I'll be more prepared looking for a job after I graduate. The learning and rehearsal of skills, whether it's arithmetic or literacy, becomes so central. What sometimes gets neglected is how do we help children grow on the inside? It's really about pivoting the conversation from education to learning and harnessing all of the assets in a community to contribute to that overall learning journey a young person takes. We need to learn a lot throughout our whole life. We should never stop learning. So as we sit here with you, looking to the future of 2022, 2023 and beyond, we have all sorts of questions. We're all mixed up in this world right now and we have lots of questions. Fortunately, we have some lessons learned that we're working to apply here and that I wanna share with you that might be helpful to you, whether you're in Warsaw or Paris or St. Petersburg, Russia. We have 15 years of building this network of thinking about the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions that we wanna cultivate for our learners in all of the places where they might learn and creating the types of experiences that are gonna ignite who they are and who they might be. And the core lesson we've learned is it, it's about us. It's about us, the grownups. It's about us, the grownups who hold positions as political leaders, as heads of trade schools and technical education, as adults who lead higher education, the librarians, the teachers, the counselors, the employers among us. It's really about how we adults understand the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions that our young people need in a way that's profoundly different than we were prepared for the world as it is now. The learning sciences, the work of the neurosciences, 
ethnographic research, demographic research, and otherwise tells us we need to go about the work of education fundamentally differently to support our young people's futures. We have to understand what was and what worked, but also understand what it is that we need to do differently to support their readiness, their skill development, their prosperities in the futures. We have to fundamentally understand that, for example, our young people, they're not gonna be building the cars, they're gonna be designing the computers that drive them. How do we support a fundamentally different sense of skill building and think about the type of readiness and the credentialing and the badging and the pathways that supports these knowledge, these skills, these dispositions that our young people need. So let me share with you seven lessons learned from our work. The first is a simple one, pancakes matter, or maybe blinis we can call them. In the work of Remake Learning, as you heard me describe briefly and is captured here by the work of Big Change, it was simply began by noticing that in fact, something different was happening in the learning spaces. In hearing teachers and youth workers and librarians saying in 2005, I'm not connecting with my students the way that I was. And beginning to notice and understand that, you know what, something seismic was happening in kids' lives. And we have the ethnographic and learning science data now to tell us. And in fact, the brain mapping to even tell us that kids are developing their identities differently, that their brains are developing differently, that they're seeking and producing information differently. And so we needed to create time and space to bring people together, to genuinely connect people who are in the formal environment with scholars and academics who are studying this work and program evaluators, those who are creating the products and services, whether it's in the public or private space, and connecting all of this in some new and some profound ways. And we do that by building relationships. And this is why pancakes mattered so much about creating those social spaces of using professional time and professional approach to create those social spaces over coffee and pancakes and blinis and whatever it might be so that the adults start to create some new relationships and adults from industries and sectors who may not have connected previously. And that's not a one-time thing. That is ongoing organizing work that has never ceased over 15 years. We have to be open and inclusive to continuously invite those who care about education into our education spaces and not just assume that they're gonna show up. And we've got to invest time in creating the relationships. Which leads to my second lesson, to lean into the self-interests that people have. Maybe you have an interest in beekeeping. Maybe you have an interest in winemaking. Each of us as individuals has interests. And the reality is our institutions, our schools and others have organizational interests. And so when we think about the adults in these systems, they bring their own interests. Maybe in a museum space, they have an interest in STEM education or they have an interest in maker-centered learning. Whereas maybe a school is focused on project-based learning or active learning or the library is focusing on digital media and making. Systems have their own interests and there are all sorts of words that they use to describe what it is that's driving their work. And we have to embrace this messiness and not say, we shall all now do STEM. The, what we all need to say is, yes. Yes, we accept all of this and all of the self-interest and the way that you describe your work and the passions of interest in, of your institutions. And then again, create the spaces where these educators with their own interests are gonna connect because they're gonna connect around math education in our rural spaces, or they're connecting in gaming and education, but what it is that they're doing is connecting in new and profound ways, and they're finding their community. They're finding others and they start to bump up against others. I came into this work with a science and technology orientation, but I've connected to art, artistry and human-centered design in some new ways that profoundly influence me and then my way, in, the way my institution starts to think about education. We have to meet people where they are. So just embrace their self-interests and accept the messiness of the language that happens in a learning ecosystem. But don't be messy about it, which leads me to lesson number three. And that is take advantage of work that's happened, whether it's here, or in Barcelona, or in Doncaster, England, and other places and communities that are thinking about 
how do we create learning ecosystems or things like ecosystems that connect in our communities, in our cities, in our countries. For us, we have a playbook, as you know, and we've tried to make it easy as, as easy as possible for people to involve themselves, not for us to involve them, but for them to involve themselves in this work. And so we've used this playbook and the lessons learned from this playbook to create some systemic strategies that support our ecosystem called Remake Learning and the ways that we go about convening, coordinating, catalyzing, communicating, and championing this work and really making it easy to have a rhythm of meetups and activities and events and documentation and grant opportunities and so much more that prompt people to involve themselves in this work and to find those things that are cross-cutting among organizations and institutions so that in working groups around STEAM education or CS, which is computer science or computational thinking, to have these collectives that bring together educators from schools and museums and libraries and others so that they bump up against each other, start to create relationships and think for us regionally, how do we advance computational thinking? How do we advance innovation and maker-centered learning? How do we advance personalized, differentiated learning for today's learners in some profound new ways? We have to encourage that cross-sector collaboration that is so profoundly important. A fourth lesson, we need to elevate community wisdom and community leadership. You hold a leadership position. You're doing remarkable work. I don't wanna discount that in any way, but there is leadership, there is wisdom all around us. There are learning ecosystems all around us and led by people who aren't identified as leaders. How do we think about marginalized people? People who maybe don't hold obvious leader positions, but are significant leaders in their community, who are profoundly influential and can make this work sticky. One of those groups are our young people themselves. As we think about the human-centered design and the experiences that our learners are having in the learning settings and what it is that they're doing, what's igniting them, what's creating barriers for them, there is no group better to turn than to the learners themselves. It could be the five-year-olds, it could be the 15-year-olds, it could be the 23-year-olds. They all are learners in this system. And we need to think about the ways that we can support them to engage them in serious conversation in education, to maybe turn over platforms of communication that invite them to project and promulgate their worries, their concerns, their ideas, and to publish that work and make it widely available. As we think about building on our strengths, there are all sorts of community leaders whom we don't recognize as leaders, but are incredibly important leaders all around us. And how do we engage them, support them, honor them, involve them in this work? Which leads me to a fifth lesson. And that is as we elevate this community wisdom and as we elevate and support our educators, how do we also take advantage of those who are deeply studying the learning sciences on our campuses of higher education and elsewhere? How do we involve those futurists, those trained, uh, those folks trained in future studies and demographics and otherwise to really help us understand where do we need to orient ourselves? How do we need, and then to know how we position ourselves for the little bets that we need to make. Because in this work of profoundly changing education from a learning ecosystem, as I said before, it doesn't happen in one grand moment. It happens in thousands and thousands of little bets that we make in our institutions and across our institutions to create this new mindset for learning. So as we sit here today, we have all sorts of futures ahead of us, all sorts of alternatives ahead of us, and we need to do the work of understanding what our preferred futures are in our communities, in our countries, on this globe. Like you, we are asking all sorts of questions about the, what the future of learning might be. And we've worked in our community to identify the elements of our preferred futures, what it is that would be most helpful to us, to our institutions and organizations and our learners themselves. And in various publications, we've tried to identify that work and tried to identify the very concrete things that we wanna realize into being. As one example that you see on the middle of the slide, what if every school had a director of relationships? Well, that's a new position. There's no one that currently holds, for the most part, a position of director of relationships in our schools. We have counselors, 
maybe not enough of them to be sure. We have teachers who are doing all sorts of relationship building all the time. But what if we had a human being in each of our schools and settings who is doing nothing more than building the social capital of our learners, building their experiences, helping them navigate in a personalized way to build out their experiences and address their experience gaps that support their education, learning passions and interests. We've been asking all sorts of questions, particularly in this moment as we look to post pandemic learning futures. What is it that comes next? And it's in this work of educators working with learning scientists and futures that again, we've identified the building blocks of the learning futures that we want. And for us, we've thought about this in the frames of justice, of methods and relationships that we want to apply in all of these learning landscape spaces from schools and beyond. As we think about the types of long-term shifts that we want to realize, as we think about justice, and for example, the ways that we support family engagement through systemic approaches that support education and learning, or the ways that we uplift social emotional learning in some profoundly new and important ways that complement the academic learning that happens. We're thinking about all sorts of methods and tactics by which we pursue this work, how we rethink time and space, how we rethink pathways and certification, how we rethink government offices like an office of personalized learning to support our learners in this new approach to knowledge and skill building that we need. And thinking about relationships, as I just described with that director of relationship type of position in our schools, on our campuses of higher education or elsewhere. But it's not just the thinking that matters, it's the doing and it's making those little bets. And we've brought together millions of dollars in this region to, to take as we describe some moonshots, some bets on the future of learning that we wanna realize and asking ourselves some really important questions about how it is that we're catalyzing innovation, how we're supporting the greatest need possible, what it is that we're focusing on as we think about catalyzing this work and making the little bets that we need. These are the types of questions that you see before us that we're asking. And so we put out to these hundreds of organizations, colleges, museums, libraries, schools, what is your moonshot? What is your moonshot for old experimental just learning, taking advantage of futuring in a way that we wanna do things differently? As just one example, a school that you've probably never heard of called the Butler Area School District, just to the north of Pittsburgh, work together to bring farmers and folks in agriculture together with community members and teachers in a rural school to think about project-based learning in a way that has lit up that school and activated science and math learning because it's connected in a relevant and engaging way that's supportive of their community and supportive of passions and interests of the community and has involved community in some brilliant think rethinking of what learning looks like and what it feels like and what learners experience in that particular school building. It's places like Duquesne University, a campus of higher education, taking advantage of digital fabrication of maker-centered learning and applying it to math and math instruction to rethink math instruction in a way that connects with today's learners in ways that will support them. We need to make these little bets and provide the time, space, and the money to educators, schools, and other sites of learning to let them equip themselves to innovate in developmentally appropriate ways um, that are profoundly important to what's happening in our learning spaces. And as we think about supporting our learners, all of us need to seriously engage parents, families, and caregivers. All of this work is going to be faddish and fleeting unless we seriously build demand and understanding among our parents, families, and caregivers. What if we thought of our parents, families, and caregivers as learning allies alongside our educators and seriously engage them in that work? We're lucky because the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC has just completed some remarkably important work drawing upon global examples and research from more than 25,000 parents from places all around this world of understanding how we might newly engage parents, families, and caregivers in really understanding who our parents are, what they think the purpose of education should be, and how they want to engage in our schools. And this work of engaging our parents, families, and caregivers, not as an afterthought, but as core to our educational thinking and reform is critical. Because as Rebecca Winthrop from Brookings says, their research, 
Their extensive data collection and longitudinal research shows that schools that have re strong relational trust with parents, families, and caregivers are securing 10 times the outcomes that we might otherwise see. If only for this reason, if not for the obvious altruistic reason, this is why we need to engage parents, families, and caregivers as learning allies, no matter the ages of our learners. And as I said, this is work drawing upon tens of thousands of parents, families, and caregivers from all across this world and understanding who it is that they want our learners to be and the kids in their own households and their own neighborhoods and their own communities that they care about. This work has also been supported by the Finnish-based organization 100 that's conducted a worldwide spotlight of parent practices that are supportive of the type of learning that you and I and others want to achieve in support of our learners. And all sorts of examples that each of us can turn to where organizations and communities are securing that sort of relational trust that attends to the type of outcomes that we wanna see. Here in Pittsburgh, we've pulled together these two organizations, Brookings and 100, along with the human-centered design folks at IDEO out of California and a local media platform called Pittsburgh to think about this work in a practical way, to take the evidence from Brookings, to take the examples from 100 and apply it in places like the New Brighton Area School District, like the Fort Cherry School District, like the Butler Area School District, schools you never heard of, but schools you can imagine in your own city in the actual places where actual learners are learning and how principals and educators are applying this worldwide world-class work in some ways that are yielding new ideas to revolutionize parent, family, and caregiver engagement that supports the type of skill building that we wanna achieve and nurture for our learners. And then opening that up to community conversation in a way that engages the broader community in thinking about how schools and communities can better partner with families to support this learning that we wanna realize. It's something that has been so core to the work of Remake Learning, of engaging our parents, families, and caregivers in what modern learning is and what modern learning needs to be. Through Remake Learning Days, we've been enabled to engage hundreds of thousands of families, not only here, but now in 20 regions across the United States and also in cities around the world by supporting regional festivals that help parents understand how learning is being remade, why they should care about it, how they support learners in their care, and then how parents themselves become part of the demand of demanding these new approaches to learning in our schools, museums, libraries, and other sites of learning. The work of Remake Learning Days has been identified by 100 as one of the top learning innovations across the world. And I encourage you to take a look at that work. Keep learners at the center of our work. And lastly, invest deeply in storytelling. We do this badly. All of us in the education field, headmasters, principals, teachers, policymakers, we do not do a good job of investing in storytelling. And we just assume we are storytellers. We don't appreciate the art and science of storytelling. It's been my biggest lesson in this work over these past two decades of building an ecosystem, of investing in the documentation, the videography, the photography that supports a shift in mindset in a region of what it is that we need to support, do to support our learners in some profoundly important ways in understanding the knowledge, skills, dispositions as we think about employment, as we think about reframing what happens in schools. You can take a look at this and download all of it in your um, work and by going to remakelearning.org and um, accessing all of the materials that we've made available and licensed under Creative Commons licensing. Tell your story. Who is it that's telling your story? It better be you because if it's not you and if you're not doing it well, other people are going to tell your story, frame the narrative in ways that aren't helpful to you. We need to think through what it is that we want to achieve and I want to uh, nearly close here by offering a very close case study because as this pandemic began to unfold worldwide, we made ourselves lucky. We made ourselves lucky in this region because late in 2019, we began to think about the continuous work that we needed to do at that point to engage schools, museums, libraries in the work of building our learning ecosystem, whether they had been involved for 13 years or 13 weeks and had prepared ourselves um, to launch a regional community-wide will building campaign to support the knowledge, skills, dispositions approach that we want. This is the video that launched that campaign. You've probably been thinking about the future a lot lately. 
about how our world is changing. About whether a robot could do your job. About how the way you get to work or shop for food or unwind at the end of the day is changing. About what kind of a world future generations will inherit. We've made it through uncertain tomorrows before. That's because we've never stopped wondering and we've never given up hope. Today, we know more than we ever have about how to solve problems, about how our brains develop, about how to stay grounded in what makes us human while exploring the frontiers of what humans can make. The future holds tremendous promise. Promise that we can find the potential inside any learner. Promise that together we can nurture that potential in each and every child. Promise that we can let loose the brilliance of an entire generation. That future is closer than you think. But to make a better tomorrow, we have to act today. Let's forge a future that holds promise for every young person. Let's connect timeless ideas with new ways of learning. Let's prepare for what comes next, no matter what tomorrow brings. Learn more at remakelearning.org slash tomorrow. This was a campaign that was supported by dozens of stories broadcast across all sorts of platforms, television stations, radio, uh, newsletters online, that people are already receiving, valuing, and respecting. Supporting by all sorts of podcasts and online conversations and events by videography and photography. And what's really important about this campaign is the way that it connected, the way in which we were able to connect not only with education officials, with school leaders and others, but with the broader public. And you can see here uh, the data from 2021, or 2020 rather, um, the tens of thousands of parents, families and caregivers that were engaged in this work, that were sharing this work. This type of data demonstrates that we can connect in a way that shifts a mindset in a region among a population about what learning is and what learning needs to be. We're all wondering together, and we need to buy, be audacious as we think about what's ahead. What do you wonder when you wonder about tomorrow? Do you wonder what you'll do or where you'll go? Who you'll meet or who you'll become? Or do you wonder how you'll be seen or how you'll be cared for? About whether you'll be hungry or housed or safe? As parents and educators, as caregivers and neighbors, we know that what we wonder about matters. We know it's on us to build a tomorrow where each day holds promise for every child. Where learning starts with the needs, the hopes, and the questions that young people bring. Where every kid can explore what excites them, what challenges them, what moves them. A tomorrow where community and belonging, justice and joy, go hand in hand and define what learning can be. Powered by Remake Learning, Tomorrow calls us to forge this future together, to take what we've learned from these difficult times and to build something better, to build places of learning that spark wonder for every child, to summon the imagination and the courage to leave normal behind, and shoot for the moon instead. For them. What comes next is up to us. Visit remakelearning.org slash tomorrow. What comes next is up to us. It's up to you. And so one final thought as we close this time together. If we're serious about supporting engaging, relevant, equitable learning in our schools, our campuses of higher education, and our museums, libraries, and all of those places where learners are learning, if we genuinely wanna connect the assets of our community in a way that supports skill development that the future calls us to build, we genuinely need to involve everyone. It sounds so simple and it is the hard work, it is the rocket science of relationship building and creating the time and space and the facilitation in our community 
of supporting learning ecosystems because no one organization, no one can transform teaching and learning to better serve today's young people for tomorrow, for their tomorrows. This is work that we have to do together as we think about what comes next and pursue the building blocks that are gonna be so critical to our learners' futures. Yes, this is incredibly important work. It is hard work and we want to prepare our future workers, but it's also about helping our learners discover their potential and their promise and believing in that purpose, helping them to become curious, caring, creative learners who can build stronger, more inclusive communities and ultimately a more just and loving world for us all. Thank you, everyone.